and thank you for joining us for this London Art Week webinar. Um, we're just waiting maybe a couple more minutes for everybody to join. Um, but as I said, thank you. Uh, my name is Emanuela Tarizzo and I'm Gallery Director at Tommaso. We are members of London Art Week and I'm a member of the board of the association. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you tonight to this conversation with the curators of the Frick Collection to, who are going to illustrate and talk to us about the temporary new home of the collection on Frick Madison at Frick Madison. Uh, so with us tonight are Xavier Salomon, who is uh, Deputy Director and Peter J. Sharp Chief Curator at the Frick, and Amy Eng, who is Curator of Paintings at the Frick Collection. Um, now, without further ado, um, if, you know, Amy uh, and Xavier would like to start and the only thing I should also say is we're going to take some questions at the end, so we're going to leave 10 to 15 minutes and if you'd like to post these in the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen, I'll be monitoring that throughout the talk and I will be just um, moderating the questions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Mela. Thank you for inviting us, and it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, so Frick Madison, um, I hope some of you may have had a chance to see it already. Um, many of you hopefully will come to the States uh, in the next few months, we hope. Um, how did it come about and why are we there? Uh, this, we keep calling it a temporary new home, and that is exactly what it is. Our home at the Frick Collection is 1 East 70th Street. It is the Beaux-Arts uh, building uh, designed by Thomas Hastings in between sort of 1912, 1914 uh, for Henry Clay Frick. Uh, this is our main um, site for the museum and it will remain so for the foreseeable future for all eternity as far as we're concerned. Um, but why are we closed at the moment? Uh, the building is 100 years old and uh, even though it's always been very well maintained, there are a number of things that needed to happen at the building. Uh, these involve skylights, uh, electrical systems, a number of, of things. Um, and, you know, the house has been maintained in this wonderful way, as you see here. Uh, these rooms were decorated by Alum and White in the 19 teens with the wood paneling, with the uh, marbles and a number of uh, precious materials, um, culminating in the Great West Gallery. Um, most of these rooms have been worked on a number of times, for example, the West Gallery, uh, the fabric has been changed a number of times. And so we're planning to restore these spaces and actually also build an, an expansion. And the expansion is designed to allow us to be able to do something that was planned from the very beginning of the Frick Collection from 1935 when it opened to the public, but was never actually achieved, which is to open uh, what we in America call the first floor, uh, what in uh, sorry, what in second floor? What in Europe is called the first floor? Slightly confusing. The upstairs, let's call it, um, which has never been open to the public. Uh, upstairs used to be uh, private rooms of the house. Um, we're not restoring them as they were, bedrooms and bathrooms, but we're actually creating a set of almost um, well more than ten new galleries. Uh, this expansion will allow us to have a new exhibition space, a new auditorium. Uh, a number, you know, a new conservation center, our first, very first education center. The Frick Collection has never had education spaces in its building. Uh, it will allow us to have uh, a restaurant, um, uh, a, a coffee place, uh, which we've also never had. Uh, so there are a number of things that uh, are going to be very important for us to have. And all of this plan is, um, the expansion plan is managed, um, designed by Annabelle Seldorf, the architect here in New York. Um, and um, we are, we're working with our conservation team, our curatorial team, Amy and I, uh, together with a group of people uh, in the curatorial team to restore these spaces. The move to Frick Madison has happened really over the past year. And the big question, of course, for us was, we, can we do all of this work while keeping the museum open? And the very first and clear answer came a few years ago, and it was, no, we cannot do this. Um, we have to close the entire campus at 170 Street to be able to do the work safely for the works of art, for the public, uh, for staff, and um, move somewhere else. So the search began in earnest about four or five years ago for an alternative to uh, 170 Street. 
And the alternative came very luckily to us in the guise of this rather surprising building for, for, for us, at least at the Frick. Uh, the Breuer building, uh, which of course belongs still to the Whitney Museum of American Art, but was leased to the Metropolitan Museum. And we're now in a very New York-like uh, real estate situation where we're subletting from the Met, who is leasing from the Whitney. Um, so we're partnering with two other museums in the city on the Upper East Side. And we decided to rename this building Frick Madison. We're going to be there for three years uh, until we're, we're currently planning to reopen, if all goes well, in 2024 at 170th Street. Work is already underway. And um, I should say that this has been a, a curatorial effort, um, which has been uh, led by a team which has changed over time. So uh, the original plans for Frick Madison were devised by Amy and me, together with Charlotte Vignon, who is a, used to be a curator of decorative arts, now the director of the museum in Sèvres, and uh, David Pollins, who is now an associate curator at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Since then, we, um, we welcomed on board Julia Dalvit, who's a new assistant curator for sculpture, and Marie-Laure Bukupongo, who is a new assistant curator for decorative arts. So that will be the team uh, leading the restoration reopening of the mansion at 1 East 70th Street. The move to Frick Madison took three years uh, in preparation. Uh, everyone is congratulating us and telling us, you know, it must be so great to enjoy this. Well, we're actually already working on the moving back to the house and we're actually quite busy with those plans for the next three years. So it's been really a nonstop experience for the, for the two of us to, to get to this building. And uh, just to say that this view of the Breuer building, which was opened in 1966, is sort of the iconic brutalist building um, by the Hungarian born Marcel Breuer. It's the only work by him uh, in the New York City. So it really stands out on Madison Avenue. And you can imagine all the shops, all the boutiques, uh, this does stand out. And it was somewhat deliberate. You can see that it, in form, it's a sort of inverted ziggurat. It actually gets bigger um, as you go up. Um, and if you just look at this uh, photograph, there are two fin walls. They're made of concrete. And they sort of block off the view of the other buildings that are next door to this, to Breuer's building. And it re he really was trying to create this little oasis of, of modern architecture. But this is a bit of a misleading photograph to some degree, because across Across both streets are, are were pre-existing buildings when Breuer was designing this that are much larger um, and are viewed out of these sort of trapezoidal windows that he has designed. Um, and just to say too that the Breuer building was a, a sort of a holistic solution to uh, the freaks needs to move out of the house at 1 East 70th Street. So in addition to allowing us to keep three gallery floors open so that we can still show the works of the Frick, it also is where we have all of our staff, our offices, our storage space and conservation uh, work. So it's sort of a, a great solution. We didn't have to parse out and rent a WeWork office and, and all that kind of stuff. We're all, all together in one place temporarily. Um, just to give a sense of preparing for this trip uh, into the Breuer building, uh, we did a little bit of curatorial research, um, visiting things like uh, other modernist buildings in which old master collections, uh, European art, are uh, ex are installed. For example, the Gulbenkian in Lisbon, which is a, a building that opened in 1969. It was purpose built for the collection of uh, Calouste Gulbenkian. Um, and there are many corollaries between the Frick's collection and the Gulbenkian collection. Uh, one example being this Udon sculpture of Diana, um, and you know this sort of language of concretes and woods and industrial uh, and modernist forms and materials, how that might create a home for European art, for old masterworks, as well as other kinds of collections. I have to admit that when my boss, <laughs> Xavier, uh, suggested that we take a curatorial field trip to um, a, a rather a curious place, Marfa, Texas, um, in order to prepare for this uh, expedition into the Breuer building. You know, it we thought it might've been a little batty, <laughs> sort of driving out to the middle of nowhere in Texas. Um, this is a place where Donald Judd um, and a number of other artists uh, have their work. Late seventies is when Donald Judd um, sort of takes over some pre-existing buildings. Um, this is an artillery shed that was also used as barracks for uh, German prisoners of war, um, a number of barracks throughout the site. Um, but 
there are two components that made this uh, curatorial field trip really essential for the move into Frick Madison. One was the obvious, you know, looking at site specific art installations, this idea of moving things into a, a pre existing place. And moving into the Breuer building means moving into a place where the architecture really is the strong uh, environmental character. And so this is a morning view of, of one of the artillery sheds. But the other really important part about this journey down to Marfa. You can't really fly into Marfa, as, as some, of, some of you might know. Um, you have to fly into one of the airports in Texas and then drive for a very long time. And we actually drove into uh, Dallas-Fort Worth in order to also visit the Louis Kahn building uh, of the Kimball Museum for the same kind of research. Eight hours in a car, uh, four curators driving down this long highway. Um, and that sort of with no cell service really. And it was that time together driving into the middle of nowhere where we were kind of forced to think through all of the options of moving the Frick's collection into this totally alien space of the Breuer building. Um, so we went through every iteration from, well, how would you, you know, what's the worst way you would install it? What if we did it by chronology? What if we did it by color, by theme, by date of acquisition? And that was like hour six, we got through everything, I think. Um, and so it was really this time together in this sort of vacuum of, of, um, of conversation about all the possibilities and eliminating what just couldn't work, what wouldn't work, um, that we came to a couple of philosophies uh, and what guides the installation at Frick Madison, which we'll walk through a little bit. We won't do a full tour, but we'll walk through with an overview, um, were a couple of things. One was you know, how to best respect the architecture that we were moving into because we didn't want to fight against the Royal Building. We wanted, we wanted to create a harmony, a, a sort of uh, a embrace of the architecture, um, but also to respect the works of art. And the most important viewing experience, I think, that, that most people appreciate the Frick Collection for is this sort of direct, intimate, unmediated sort of access to the works of art at the Frick Mansion. That means no glass, no barriers, um, really just you and the works of art in a very domestic setting. How do we translate that? into a modernist setting. So um, you'll see uh, through a, a few of the, the floors that we're gonna walk through just briefly um, explaining some of the curatorial decisions and maybe Xavier you can talk even about the overall organization across the three floors. And then we'll just do bits and pieces uh, of the, the three floors of gallery space in order to show also things that we have never been able to do at the Frick House that we have been able to do and show here. So really, I, I keep telling people it's an experiment in translating and deconstructing. Um, you know, the, the examples I keep bringing is translating a great book in a foreign language. You know, we're translating the Frick Collection in a foreign language effectively. And how do we do that through this building, which in itself, you like it, you hate it. People are very polarized about the Broy building, but it is a really great modernist building from 1966. So we, we, as Amy said, fully embraced that and decided not to go down the, the idea of reconstructing spaces. You know, we could have done that, reconstruct spaces with velvet walls and, 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 and wooden, you know, um, sort of panels to kind of give the uh, intimate feeling of the house. This is temporary it's for three years. We can try something else and be brave and, and, and embrace a different look before we go back to the house fully restored and looking uh, marvelous as it usually does. Um, I personally am already missing the house and cannot wait to go back. But in the meantime, I think this is a very interesting and fresh way to look at, at the collection. It also allows us, you as, as the visitors and everyone knows the Frick more or less well, to look at things in a very different way and to deconstruct um, the, the collection. I keep telling people is as if you go to your favorite restaurant to eat your favorite dish and suddenly they show you what the actual ingredients are. And you realize that there are things in there that you never noticed were in there. Uh, one of the, and we'll talk a little bit more about this at the end, but one of the general responses to Frick Madison is, was that in storage? I've never seen this. Where was that? And pretty much everything was on view. And it's amazing to realize how invisible things become, especially in a house context. And that is particularly true of uh, what we wrongly call decorative arts. Um, people think of the Frick as a paintings collection. Well, there are some great paintings, but there are also some truly great sculptures and, and pieces of decorative arts. So we're trying to sort of reshuffle that. Uh, we have three floors at Frick Madison dedicated to galleries. As Amy said, we also have our offices, storage, everything, library, reading room. It's all at Frick Madison right now and open to the public and, and functioning. Um, you start with this great lobby. 
and then you move upstairs. And what we decided to do is divide each floor according to features of the architecture of that floor and divide it all by chronology and school. It's a boring way, but it is the way in which many museums in the world are structured. And frankly, for us, it's an interesting way because we've never showed it that way. And what it does show is the strengths and weaknesses of the Frick Collection. We are not an encyclopedic museum. We're not designed to fill gaps. There are many things that are missing. So for example, the second floor, which is entirely dedicated to Northern art, um, from around the 15th century to the late 16th, sorry, 17th century, um, there is only one three-dimensional object. We don't own a single piece of decorative art from the Netherlands or Flanders or Germany. Um, and in terms of sculpture, we also somewhat cheated by introducing a French uh, work of art, which is north of the Alps, but it's not quite northern as we, as we define it. And then as we will see, the third floor is Italian, Spanish, and a number of other things. And the fourth floor is uh, French and British. Uh, the second floor has lower ceilings and wooden floors, which is why we decided to put the Northern collection there. So the idea of matching um, collections to the environment was something that we very much wanted to do. Uh, there are some general rules about the, the collection of Frick Madison. We wanted no color. We wanted um, a number of grays that sort of disappear in the building. We didn't want to introduce any materials that have not been used by Breuer and are not in the building. So the architecture is in a way highlighted, a little bit like Marfa, but also disappears. The focus is on the works of art. We were given the four perimeter walls of each floor and with Seldorf and with our designer, Stephen Saitas, we created spaces. It's the dream of every curator to actually create spaces around groups of works of art that you choose before you have the spaces. So we designed everything and it really started in Marfa before the architects were involved. We were really by a motel poolside sketching rooms and deciding what would go on each wall. And what Marfa taught us is that in terms of contemporary art, if someone tells you that you're going to hang a Rothko or a great piece of, of you know, Twombly or Rauschenberg by itself, no one would bat an eyelid. If you say I'm going to show a Rembrandt in a room by itself, everyone say, are you crazy? But actually, that's not right. And, and what we try to do is, is use the works of art in conversation with one another and sometimes in isolation to highlight the importance of some of these objects. On each floor, you start with sculpture. So every time you come out of the elevators at the Whitney or the staircase, you're confronted with something three-dimensional that welcomes you, so to speak, on each floor. In this case, the Balba Angel, which is one of only two objects, as we will see, who is given a room by itself. And it is really probably the most important piece of sculpture of the Frick, also one that is constantly ignored because of its usual location in the house. And the Balba Angel leads you into a series of rooms through early Netherlandish art with some pauses. So as you go through and pass Bruegel and Van Eyck and Memling, there, are, there is a little alcove with the two uh, Holbeins, Thomas More and Thomas Cromwell, who usually face each other across the chimney piece uh, at the Frick with El Greco in the middle and furniture underneath. And here they are in this very brutal, in a way, encounter um, one against the other on a single wall. Through the um, Dutch 17th century school, portraiture and, um, and landscape, you arrive to this great vista down to Rembrandt. And um, it's the beginning of three rooms about individual artists. Rembrandt is the first one. We have all three of our Rembrandts together in a room absolutely by themselves, one on each wall. Uh, you can sit in the middle and turn around and you're surrounded by these three spectacular paintings and uh, a much grander gallery for Van Dyck, a gallery where there are surprises again because um, Many people don't notice that Van Dyck is actually the top painter in terms of numbers at the Frick. We have eight Van Dyck's closely followed by Gainsborough. We have seven. Um, and so this is the first time that all eight Van Dyck's are in a room together by themselves, including things that were previously in storage, i.e. in my office. Um, the painting you see at the very end here, I lived with for the last seven, eight years. Um, so it's now in the galleries. Uh, these are the three Genoese Van Dyck's together, and then there are the three British ones and the two from the Antwerp period. And then last but not least on the northern floor, um, a room with the three Vermeers by themselves. If you have a tenth of Vermeer's work in your museum, why not show it together instead of showing it in two different rooms, which is what we usually do at the house. So here they are 
simply shown um and the display is an aesthetic one it's they're, they're shown in a way that they work together it's not chronological it's it's just meant to look uh beautiful in that space and and speak to each other in a number of different ways one then moves up to the third floor where um the look shifts quite dramatically in terms of color and in terms of subject matter and I just want to note here before we leave the second floor and, and this most celebrated room, people sometimes jump off the elevator and like run directly into this room. You can see it from the, as, as the elevator door is open. Um, typically these are paintings that are shown in the, in the Frick's house with furniture in front of them, um, partially for, for safety to keep distance, but also because it's part of the, the domestic uh, environment and domestic installation at the Frick house. Not having... Um, objects of furniture in front of these means that visitors can see very closely uh, the details of these paintings and, and the number of people who've sort of pointed out things, you know, these are very well known uh, images. Um, and yet things like that little glass of wine in one of them or the musical notes that you can actually almost read um, in uh, girl interrupted at her music at the left, these little things have been sort of discovered uh, slowly by some of our, our visitors. So this is the, the third floor, um, and this is Italy and Spain and other things. Um, and again, there are th the, the greeters uh, as you come to this floor from the elevator, from the stairs, um, are sculptural objects, two busts by Lorana and one by Verrocchio. And we never actually get to show them together like this, all three. Um, in the house, we've usually had them separated in various galleries. You know, these are always busts that uh, are mired in attributional issues and a lot of scholarly debate. Um, and this is actually the chance to show them all three together and really compare them as opposed to sort of separating them and, and not not wanting them put together um, because of some uh, questions about where they come from, who who have made them. Um, this is the chance to really be very uh, straightforward about about what the contents of the collection are and, and stark views of them as well. Um, and this leads into rooms devoted to parts of the collection, for example, that were um, acquired after uh, the death of Henry Clay Frick, the founder of the museum by his daughter, uh, particularly was devoted to uh, Italian gold ground pictures. Um, in this view, it's Cimabue and a few, uh, four Piero della Francesca's and a Gentile da Fabriano, but behind, the wall behind me that you can't see has Duccio um, and Barna da Siena. Um, and one thing that we wanted to introduce uh, in Frick Madison was works of art that we don't typically get to show or don't often have the opportunities to show at the Frick house. Um, and through this uh, vista from the Gold Grounds room looking to the next one, um, we've made this juxtaposition of two uh, Italian pictures that have uh, cloths of honor and some kind of articulation of textiles, either worn or, or draped, um, that allude to sort of a larger global trade. So there are certainly um, elements in the paintings that point to textiles coming into Italy from Persia, from China, from Japan. Um, and that's sort of a, an introduction to the material aspect of Frick Madison, an exploration of rooms like the, the one through this doorway, which focuses on two um, very significant uh, 17th century Mughal carpets, uh, Northern Indian carpets in the Frick's collection. Uh, they're very, very infrequently on view. The last time they were shown, was about 15 years ago. Uh, and they are, as textiles, light sensitive. So they cannot be on view for the entirety of our time uh, at Frick Madison, but it's great to be able to open uh, the installation with uh, visitors encountering these as works of art on the walls, just to like um, some of the treasured paintings. Um, and this, this kind of installation is something too that, you've, that many of you will have seen at the Gulbenkian and elsewhere. Um, and this leads into the room of porcelains. Uh, this is a, a mixture of European and Asian porcelains. And the display, while it's very, very modern appearing in terms of those very clean cut square uh, shelves, um, it, this obviously harkens back to 18th century displays. Augustus the Strong in Dresden, this idea of these walls of porcelain created as a sort of composition by color. Um, and it's, it's been nice to be able to mix uh, European and Asian porcelains to sort of tell the story of that intertwined history of, of porcelains uh, as they developed in both places. Um, and just a quick view into from the porcelain room into go, sort of going back into Italy. There's a made like a large Italian gallery at the center of which, Xavier, I wonder if you'll just speak a little bit, if you'd like to, about uh, the Francesco da San Gallo Baptist at the very center of this uh, large Italian gallery. 
So the 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 idea here, I mean, the the Whitney Museum, the the Broy Building, was designed for works of art, contemporary works of art in the sixties, that were intended by the artists who made them to eventually end up in a museum. Everything at the Frick Collection, and I mean everything, was never intended to be in a museum. Every single one of these objects was made for a church, for a villa, for a palace, for somebody's house, for a number of different reasons. So one of the biggest challenges of anyone working in the old masters field is how do you bring some of that original context back in? You know, when we know um, where something was created for, which is not very often, how do we deal with that? So this is a case in point. The little statue by Francesco da Sangallo is the only signed bronze by Francesco da Sangallo in the world. Um, it's usually on a base on a table in the West Gallery, happily ignored by everyone who walks by. Um, this was originally the crowning part of a holy water stoop font, uh, which was paid off by the vegetable and melon sellers of Prato for a church that was designed by Francesco da Sangallo's father, Giuliano. And um, when you go to the church today in Prato, the holy water stoop, the marble one is still there, surmounted by a bronze copy made around 1909 of our San Gallo sculpture, which was sold at the end of the 19th century through Bardini to a number of collectors and eventually to the Frick. Um, and every time I've seen that, I always wondered, why don't we do the opposite? Why don't we actually get a facsimile of the, the base? And of course, we couldn't do that in the house, but it's something that we could do at the Broya. So we worked closely with Pacto Marte. We did a 3D scan of the marble font uh, in Prato. Um, and here it is. So for once, you're, you're actually able to notice this piece in a very different way and actually understand somewhat, a little bit, what it was conceived for. Breuer's architecture is clearly not Giuliano da Sangallo's. This is clearly not a church, but um, people have get, again have paused and look at one of our objects in a very different and very new way. And I'm, I'm very excited by this. The font is actually not made out of marble. It's um, scagliola and wood, which means that it comes apart and we can uh, recycle it and reuse it if we ever choose to do so in the future. And uh, it's, it sits at the center of this suite of galleries. For those of you who will have a chance to come to Frick Madison, um, it, it's a sort of a cruciform shape. And, and from this large central, in this large central gallery, um, there's a little alcove of sort of 18th century Venetian works. And I'm just bringing you here because uh, it's a chance for us to show two new acquisitions um, in the Frick's collection, which are, are being shown for the very first time here. Um, and these are on the, si the right side here. Um, and on the left side here, it's a pair of pastels by Rosalba Carriera coming from the, the collection of Alexis Gregory. Um, there's a, a few works that have uh, joined the Frick's collection over the last 18 months that are on view for the first time at Frick Madison. So that's been very special as well. Um, the sort of crowning part of this cruciform suite of galleries um, is the now very uh, celebrated Bellini Chapel, let's call it. Um, and this is, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later on, but this is sort of one of the first decisions, I think curatorially that were made in terms of what would go where in this sort of, you know, blank slate of a, of a building. Um, there are two trapezoidal windows that would be available for a gallery uh, installation. Um, and this was one opportunity where we could sort of return uh, Bellini St. Francis to his coveted um, solitude, um, but also put him into some kind of communication with the natural light, um, which he's obviously communing with within the painting. But for the first time, um, because at the Frick Mansion, the window is actually on the other side of the room, the painted figure is actually communing to some degree with the actual natural light coming in from the Breuer window. Um, and just a note that the building scene across the street, it's an apartment building, it's a condo building, that was there already when Breuer was building and designing. So this, this view, you know, some people are like, oh my gosh, I, I'm looking at this building into people's apartments. That was how Breuer had planned this already. It was really embedded in the city with city views like this. Um, throughout the house at, at 1 East 70th Street, sculpture is usually on tabletops and on shelves and in corners and half lit. Um, and we decided to pay tribute to the extraordinary collection of sculpture, especially bronze sculpture in the Frick's collection by devoting a gallery to it. So this is the bronze room. This uh, sort of uh, pedestal at the center with the, the three bonnets, 
this is one of the very rare cases in which we do have cases some glass uh, between the viewer and the works of art. And this is for conservation reasons. Some of these require uh, quality control, uh, humidity control, quality control and condition control. But we're sort of evoking in a sense, the, the sort of studiolo, that sort of scholars uh, study um, with you know, these groups of sculpture that would have been handled and studied by many Renaissance and, and 17th century collectors. And you can see here very well, the stone floor that distinguishes this third floor from the one below. Um, this leads into the big Spanish gallery, all nine of the Frick's uh, Spanish pictures, that's four Goyas, three El Grecos, uh, Velasquez, Murillo, um, are all together. And it's sort of this amazing moment thinking about uh, an early collector of Spanish uh, old master paintings in America, which Henry Clay Frick was, uh, seeing all of these together in a room um, and sort of the breadth of, of that collection. And finally on this floor is sort of the most Kunstkammeri kind of uh, gallery, which is devoted to different kinds of uh, decorative arts uh, components within the collection from uh, saint prochere ware which you see on the left. Um, one of those objects also is a, a recent acquisition from the dressoir, the furniture in the center, maiolica, enamels, etc., um, as well as some um, um, an important collection of clocks, uh, European clocks. Um, and from there we go to the third, the fourth floor, which is uh, devoted to France and Britain. And in a way, the um... The, the Kunstkammer-like room introduces the theme of France because it sort of links quite naturally the Italian and sort of Southern um, galleries of the third floor up to the, to, to the fourth floor and the grandest of the floors. It's difficult to see from these photographs, but the fourth floor is double height and it's the grandest floor at the Broya uh, with these um, stone floors again. And what we decided to place here is French and British art which by num for a number of reasons tends to be the largest works of art at the Frick, uh, but also some of the most numerous. And, and what I keep repeating to people is that Frick Madison is a selection of works from the Frick, it's not the full collection. And the area in which we had to make the most compromises is really this area for French and British art where we had to make some quite substantial cuts. Um, we would have otherwise, I mean, I wish we had an extra floor of French and British. We could have probably easily done with a floor of British and a floor of French, but that's um, that's the reality of the building. So you start with 18th century France with Boucher, Fragonard, uh, sorry, with Boucher, Chardin, Greuze, and Watteau, not quite Fragonard yet. Um, but from the paintings, you move into one of my two favorite rooms on this floor, which is a, a room where we decided to have furniture and porcelain as the great works of art they are with nothing else without paintings and actually in terms of 18th century France the largest room is given to the furniture and porcelain rather than to the paintings um, so some of the great pieces of furniture the Gutierre table the Tourism Mers, the clock um, these are some of the best pieces of 18th century Fra uh, French furniture in, uh, in in America the Gutierre table has really no equal anywhere else in the world uh, the um, this has a, a, a sort of garniture on top that is sort of created out of combining uh, Meissen mounted by Gutierre and, and Sèvres, um, sort of, you know, something we put together. But the two Riesners on each side instead um, were the last pieces of furniture that are known to have belonged to Marie Antoinette and that she lived with at the Tourerie before uh, she was beheaded. And the problem with this furniture at the Frick is that the Riesners are near the Vermeers and the Gutierre is under the Angre. So people really ignore them. Um, so this was a way to treat them like you would treat a great piece of sculpture, a great painting in isolation. You look at them, you, you admire them in this way. And because this type of furniture had, had usually garnitures on top of them, uh, again, the minute you put pieces of porcelain on top of a piece of furniture, they become invisible. So what we decided to do was to come up with this idea of, of shelves that are slightly floating above the piece of furniture so that you could actually, again, uh, deconstruct what is usually in the house and you see them as individual elements um, that create more or less a whole in this way, um, a very undomestic one, but one that looks to domestic models in one way or another. Um, we move into Britain before going back to France with this very grand gallery of portraiture and a room of landscapes. And the two rooms really work together. The landscapes, we decided to just go along with a textbook comparison, Constable Turner. 
the greatest constable, supposedly constable's own favorite work he ever produced. He, so, he sold it and then bought it back at huge expense and never sold it, kept it with, it, with him for his whole life, his favorite six footer, uh, with on each side the two great turners, uh, Dieppe and Cologne, which are usually in the West Gallery, surrounded by lots of other things. But here you really can see that um, comparison between Constable and, and Turner in a way that people would have seen at the Royal Academy shows, the summer shows um, every year uh, in London. And the portrait gallery instead um, is a combination of all seven of our Gainsboroughs plus Romney, plus Reynolds, uh, Lawrence, uh, and, um, and just sort of showing the tradition of British portraiture in the 18th to the early 19th century, with then another little sort of alcove which moves forward um, to Whistler. And actually Whistler is the best represented artist at the Frick Collection overall. Um, I mentioned that Van Dyck and Gainsborough are in terms of paintings, but Whistler, we have 20 works by Whistler. We have um, five paintings, uh, 12 etchings from the first Venice set and three pastels. Uh, but these are the four portraits together in a room. And it's wonderful because when you're actually standing in this room, you can really see the relationship between these portraits and the tradition of British portraiture from sort of country houses with Gainsborough and Reynolds. Incidentally, the painting on the right, the, uh, the portrait of uh, Robert de Montesquieu, is the most recent, uh, most modern work of art on display at Frick Madison, 1892-93, uh, that is as modern as we go. Um, going back into the, the British Portraiture Gallery, you then end up in another room, which is first half, 19th century, uh, in France. And this is a combination of Ingres, David, Gérard and uh, one piece of sculpture, the Chinar bust of uh, Etienne Vincent Marmiola. Um, and again, these are paintings that are used and, and a sculpture that are usually in different places of the Frick. And here you really see them in dialogue, these two wonderful um, portraits of women by David on the right and the Contessa Sonville uh, on the left, uh, with then the Gérard Camilo Borghese on the left uh, of this room. And then from here, you end up in one of the other grand spaces of this floor, which is the remake of the Fragona room with the very, very large Breuer, building, uh, Breuer window looking down to Madison Avenue. And what we wanted to do here was to do two things. First of all, um, split the Fragona room in two, making people understand the difference between the first campaign of the 1770s for Madame du Barry at Lucienne, and then the second in the other room for the 1790s uh, for uh, Grasse, for the house of the Maubert family, which were the cousins of Fragonard. We cannot do this at the Frick because all of the paintings are together, but what we can do at Frick Madison is show uh, the four original canvases done for Madame du Barry in the original order, around the window, which is how they were displayed at Lucienne. And actually some critics have said, oh, you know, it's so awful to see these outside of boiseries and paneling. Guess what? Madame du Barry didn't have them with any boiserie or paneling. They were actually hanging on white walls at Lucienne, um, fabric walls, but white walls with very thin frames exactly like this in this order. So this is gonna be the one chance that you can see the Fragonard room as Fragonard more or less originally intended it. There are, of course, uh, exceptions that you realize, and this photo makes it um, clear, even if it exaggerates it, uh, the, the painting on the left is actually thinner than the one on the right, something you don't actually notice at the Frick. And that is because the one on the right and the one across from it were originally on curved stretchers, um, slightly larger, and they were following the curve of an apse uh, in the uh, pavilion at Lucienne. The second group uh, in the other room includes these four beautiful hollyhocks panels, three of which are not on view at the Frick. And that is because, again, people don't often realize this, uh, the Fragonard room as it stands at the Frick was already built as a space when Frick acquired the Fragonards and put them in. And there wasn't, there wasn't space for all of them. So three of the hollyhocks were sacrificed and put in storage. One is there, but it's actually behind the door. You would never see it unless you close the door. So this is, again, a great chance to be able to see all four of the hollyhocks together, uh, which are actually part of some of my favorite panels of the, of the Fragner Room. And they've been a big rediscovery for people to see and admire. And we're now working on ways in which we can have these three hollyhocks on view back at the Frick, of course, not in the Fragner Room, but somewhere else in the building. And then you reach the final room of uh, Frick Madison, the 
26 room, I believe, um, which is the room of Impressionism. And it's slightly cheating in a way, because as I mentioned before, Whistler is the most modern work. These are all paintings from the 1870s. Uh, the Whistler is from the 1890s, so it, these are a little earlier. Uh, but there is a wonderful passage from Fragonard to Corot and, and, and Impressionism. You really see that trajectory, especially when you look at the Hollyhocks and then the Great Lake by, uh, by Corot, and you finish with Frick's collection, very small but uh, important collection of Renoir, Degas, uh, Manet, and of course the Monet um, that was acquired later on. Frick acquired Monet's, but not this one. This was acquired by the museum later in the 40s. And uh, we didn't really want to get everyone to leave with the last view of Renoir. So we actually opened this, this last view down to the Comtesse de Sonville, which actually is also about thinking, uh, amazing as that may sound, at how much an artist like Renoir is looking at Ingres for inspiration. And to the left of the Ingres, you also see uh, the Degas ballerinas, which um, here, here you see the Ang fate um, sort of um, uh, framed by Monet and Degas. Uh, there is a moment in 1855 when the very, very young Degas meets his great idol, the very old Ang. And, you know, I wish we could have all been flies on the wall for that conversation. But it, this is really to, to draw links between these surprising in a way encounters, but actually very important ones. And so this is, um, you know, we, we leave our, our, our viewers with this, you know, the Frick, as I said earlier on, is not an encyclopedic collection. Uh, we don't go beyond really the end of the 19th century, uh, but this is um, a way to show the wealth of the collection in an, under a new light. Uh, and with regard to sort of, you know, insights, um, that Frick Madison has afforded us, part of the uh, part of the experience has been, especially after COVID, and of course we were planning on this well before the pandemic, um, and so a lot of the installation um, was inspired by the principles that I that I suggested previously, that sort of respect to the architecture and the art and the viewing experience, which was so direct and so intimate and unmediated. Um, this proved to be so essential for our visitors that you know those who flocked to Frick Madison once it opened on March 18th, people were just standing and looking. Um, and they would spend a lot of time just in front of works of art looking very closely, you know, a year on screens, um, you know, to, to have time in a museum in which the galleries were in, in some ways very sparsely uh, installed so that there were, you know, there was no sense of rush. It, it's not like you're, you're not going to see everything at Frick Madison, you can be in and out of there um, in an hour. But the idea that you, you could spend the time because the, the pacing is, is slow. It's meant to be slow for looking. Um, and I think you've noticed through some of the installation images that there are no labels. Um, for every single work of art, there is a an identifying label. So either on the frame, you you know, the artist, the, the title of the work, for sculpture, same thing, everything can be identified. Um, but there's no text on the walls that are telling you anything didactic about it, anything that you should be thinking about or that you should know about the works of art. All of that information is offered uh, in individual uh, handbooks. So every single visitor comes in with a physical book that they can look up anything that they'd like to read. Um, this, ten this ended up being actually very COVID friendly as well because nobody was sort of gathered around a label on the wall trying to read it. Everybody has it for themselves. Um, and we also partnered with Bloomberg Philanthropies um, to launch a new app on their Bloomberg Connects app. And every single, nearly every single object has an audio guide number discreetly next to it. So you can actually listen to commentary while looking. And sort of this was a, you know, this was one of the big uh, observations that, you know, people do enjoy looking and, and the number of people sort of pause um, and linger and especially in rooms uh, like uh, the Fragonard room like this, um, but also and especially the Bellini Chapel. Uh, you invite people to sit with a bench and, and don't give them too much, uh, too much to, to think about outside of what they choose to pursue in, in terms of extra information um, regarding you know, reading in the book or listening. But you know, the sort of quiet um, contemplation and looking and rediscovering, I think has been really revealing. Um, and I think Xavier, you might wanna close with your fresh insights of uh, Frick Madison. Well, I think what you know this did 
to all of us and made us think of the collection in different ways. Uh, it's informing the way in which we will look at some of the collection going back to the house. Of course, going back to the house means most things are gonna go back exactly to where they were in the house. We're not planning to revolutionize that in any way, shape or form. Uh, but for us, knowing the collection, there were some surprises. Um, I personally don't feel there were many in the sense that the objects are there because we chose to put them there and we knew the objects. Other people seem to be surprised at seeing certain objects and keep asking me like, did you know you had that? And it's like, well, yes, I did, I put it there. But you know, it's, um, it's I think, a, a, a great opportunity to sort of interact with a, a wider public. And does a different building attract a different audience? Well, the answer is yes, surprisingly, yes. People are interested, we are having a much more, uh, diverse younger audience coming to Frick Madison being interested in it is a house like the the Frick collection a psychological barrier in a way uh, to certain people wanting to come and see it the answer is yes of course we need to work more on 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 um, sort of making that psychological barrier less of a of, of, of a barrier for the future uh, but the Frick is a historic building from a specific time. And, you know, we can't really do and don't want to do anything about it in the sense that it is uh, uh, it is capturing uh, a collection, you know, put together by a robber baron in the early 20th century. Um, here, there is really a chance to try and understand more how these works of art work together. And all these works of art have only been at the Frick for about 100 years. Uh, they all had very complex and convoluted histories before that in a number of different places. So um, seeing them under this, you know, concrete roof uh, is is really giving all of us an opportunity to uh, rethink some of these works and their relationships with one another. And hopefully for people who know and love the Frick to rediscover certain things and look at things uh, under a fresh light. So I think we should open the floor uh, for questions uh, in case anyone from the public has any questions and maybe welcome Emanuela back to ask some questions. Hi, hello. Um, thank you so much. Uh, that was an absolute treat, a wonderful tour, especially for someone like me who is in London, hasn't been able to visit and I'm sure uh, there's many of us here who are not able to travel at the moment. So this was really amazing. Um, we do have some questions. Um, we have one question from Alan Dar about the Kunstkammer room. I don't know if Amy, you, you have a chance to sort of flick back to that slide. Um, there's an impressive large piece of furniture under the Maiolica plate. Um, has it been on view? So did you know you had that? Did you, did you know you had that? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the furniture is actually a very interesting one. It was bought by Frick. It used to be in, so the enamels room, as we call it, at the end of the West Gallery, was originally built as Frick's office, and then Frick moved his office somewhere else very soon after that, and turned that room into an enamels room for enamels and French Renaissance furniture, which he bought in quite uh, vast quantities. Um, later on, a lot of that French furniture, including this piece, were considered, of course, to be fakes and not being quite right. And they were relegated to storage. And at the same time, Miss Frick, Frick's daughter, bought a lot of gold grounds and decided to put them in the enamels room, sending a lot of the enamels to storage. Our plan is to restore the enamels room back to what it was and actually move the gold ground somewhere else. And this piece of furniture has undergone a lot of work by a conservator, Joe Godla, and a lot of research. And it turns out that it's actually absolutely right. It's a 15th century piece of French furniture um, in pretty great shape, actually. A um, couple of things have been replaced and a couple of things have been played with. Um, another one of these, which is um, designed, people say it's dependent to this, has uh, appeared recently around. And it turns out that actually the other one is a, a total forgery done after this one. The only thing that has happened is that the back of our piece of furniture is new and the back of the new piece of furniture is the back of ours. So that is quite a sort of interesting thing that happened. And we know exactly who the restorer who uh, restored this, I think in Marseille is, because he signed and dated his restoration inside the carcass of, uh, of this piece. So we have a lot of information about it. Uh, but this is something that will be back on view at 170th Street. It used to be on view there uh, until, I think, uh, after the war, and then, it, and then it went to storage. Thank you. Um, there is another question about, you showed those beautiful um, tapestries, and I believe rugs as well. Um, and obviously you said because of light sensitivity, they, they can't be on display. 
uh, permanently. So what will replace them? Um, Maybe so, you want to take that? Yeah, I'll take this. <laughs> uh, there's going to be a temporary exhibition in this room uh, starting in March of next year. Uh, we can't really say what that is yet, uh, but stay tuned and there will be something in that room for six months next year. Uh, we, will, we don't have an exhibition space at Frick Madison. This doesn't mean that we're not doing exhibitions. What we're doing is a number of installations, interventions. We're working with contemporary artists. We're working with uh, a number of uh, objects from our collection and two significant donations that have come or will be coming to the Frick. So we're going to be displaying a number of different things, always within a room or a couple of spaces. Um, so there's going to be some turning around. So the way you see the installation right now, uh, it's not going to be static for the next three years. There's going to be certain things that will shift around, not drastically, but in some ways. So we'll give the carpets a little bit of a rest for six months, maybe a little longer than that, and then they will come back before we move back. And the idea is that once we're back at the house, the, the, the carpets also will uh, potentially come out at different times. Uh, but, you know, it's something we can really do only um, on a few occasions every few years because they are indeed very, very light sensitive and, and very delicate. And very rare, I, I would also add. There aren't a lot of Mughal carpets like this uh, outside of India. Thank you. Um, and I mean, um, when Amy earlier, actually, as you were showing us the slides, I was kind of squinting at my screen and, and trying to see if there were any labels. And then you mentioned the point about labels and the kind of viewing experience that you were trying to um, um, achieve and but there is also a question um which maybe you can answer to uh, quickly about frames and whether you changed any of the of the frames with the move uh but hey, there are, there are only a couple of it no most of the anything that had an existing frame uh, retains the frame at frick madison with the exception of a few things uh these by the way just now that we're stopping on them they were refinished the wood frames of these carpets they they had a previous frame that still is the same frame, but this was refinished to match the, the staining on the wood banister in the Breuer staircase. So to pick up that color of the wood uh, in the staircase and bring that into this gallery. Um, in other instances, there's an El Greco port, uh, El Greco painting of St. Jerome that typically was a, sort of within the wood paneling in the living hall of the Frick house. Um, we've actually borrowed, we have a frame on loan um, from the Met in order to, to have that there. And for things like, um, that are typically embedded in a wall, uh, either the frames were amended slightly um, or, you know, or, or the edges were sort of fixed with, with a sort of a, a covering. Um, but for the most part, the, the frames are exactly what had been on view at the Frick. The funny thing is, is how, especially for example, in the Rembrandt room, if I can go there, is how large um, these frames suddenly seemed to be once we took them out of the crates and put them on the walls here, just because, you know, not fighting, fighting against fabric wall coverings or wainscoting or any other decorative details, curtains, et cetera, suddenly these frames took on this life of their own. And so people are noticing them more as well. So I will say that. Thank you. Um, there is another question again about display and um, it's about lighting and whether that was difficult to sort of uh, achieve the lighting in, in this new space. But, and if I may add, I, you know, the, the, the sculpture, the, the way that you, you've been able to display the sculpture in this, in this new space uh, seems fantastic to be able to really appreciate it. One of the things in, in Frick House is sometimes it's, it's difficult to see the sculpture. So I guess, was it difficult uh, in the, at um, Frick Madison, but also is there anything about the display of, of objects that you could, do you think, translate back into the, the traditional home of the Frick from this display? Well, the lighting issue, the, the simple answer is yes, it was a nightmare. Um, but that is because um, the lighting system is still the Whitney's lighting system. The Met did not really upgrade that and we didn't really upgrade that. So we're still living with an old light system that um, lighting system that we could 
play with a little bit, but not so much. The photographs you're seeing, for those of you who haven't been to the building, actually show it all as, it, it looks much more dramatic than it actually is. Nothing is spotlit. Everything is very evenly lit, actually. But there are, there are canister lights. Uh, we have a fantastic lighting designer, Anita Jorgensen, who's worked at the mansion and worked with us many, many, for many years. And, you know, the lighting at the mansion is challenging. So she went from one challenging setup to another challenging setup. But um, in some ways, it, things read better than at the house. You know, once we go back to the house, the lighting will still be challenging. And I actually want it to be challenging because the house is uh, an early 20th century house and you have to see it under those conditions. Having LED fantastically lit lights in, a, in an old house like that makes absolutely no sense. Those pictures were not designed to be seen under those conditions. Uh, they were not designed to be seen under any electrical light, frankly, but as much as I would love to have candlelight everywhere, we're not going to be able to do that for obvious reasons. Um, so here, I think you have it under a more modern museum condition, so to speak. Um, but we worked very hard and, and Amy and I spent a lot of time with the lighting, actually much longer than with the hang in terms of getting it just right on each floor and, and going back over and over again on, on different ones. Having said this, we are working on the lighting at the house and there will be some improved um, situations at the house. Um, and I think all of this is giving us some tips about how certain objects can be displayed back at the house. But we're not going to have a room of just bronzes at the house or a room of just carpets because that's not the nature of the house as a whole. Um, so all of the, the display, even on the, on the second floor, the new second floor, will be somewhat domestic. Uh, I should add that we're restoring some historic spaces. The Boucher room, which was downstairs, actually used to be upstairs. It was moved downstairs in the 30s when the upstairs were turned into offices. So we are moving the Boucher. That's for those of you who love 18th century French paintings. That's the one thing that's not at Frick Madison because we're actually working on moving the whole thing back upstairs to where it was. Uh, and there was a breakfast room upstairs, beautiful breakfast room with fabrics. And it was where all the Barbizon school paintings were, Rousseau, Millet, um, Coro, all of those pictures, which actually we can't really show very much at the house right now. And we're going to reinstate that room exactly as it was with the original fabric and everything. So there's going to be some full on restoration and then other rooms that will have grouping of objects that make sense in the context of a domestic um, Gilded Age setting. Thank you. And I think um, that is just probably we can take one last question um, about the sort of any new acquisitions for the collection um if there is anything you know and whether you're planning on any new acquisitions for when you move back into the mansion so in that respect i think you know the frick has always been meant to be a collection that grows has grown almost by half since uh well actually more than half since it was founded in 1919 but it doesn't have the frick does not have an acquisitions um budget of any kind or fund we never did uh, we've been buying things ad hoc uh, through donations and through the support of trustees or donors, and that's how we still do it. Most of the important objects that have come to us recently have come through important donations, the Steve Scher collection of medals, Alexis's, Alexis Gregory's Rosalba's, but also another 26, 27 objects in terms of decorative arts. Um, the Kate Feldstein gave us, you could just see it here next to the left of the Garrett David, there is a beautiful Salman Van Roysdel, which was a gift of our trustee Kate, Kate Feldstein uh, just about a year ago. Um, so we're definitely encouraging gifts. There's going to be more coming and we'll present some more in the next couple of years, more promised gifts and things that we will announce in the future. Um, acquisition wise, as you can imagine, the restoration of the house and the expansion is not exactly cheap. We're fundraising for that, which means that acquisitions for us will be on the shelf for the next five years for sure. So I don't think the museum will actually be out buying. Uh, but we are going to still work on, on improving areas of the collection and having more. But it's fair to say that our focus right now is going to be on a, on a very major capital campaign uh, for the building and for the future of the institution uh, rather than for its contents. Um, at the same time, um, if you have marvelous things and want to give them to us, we're, we're here and we're all very happy to, to receive wonderful gifts. Excellent. Well, then I think on this note, <laughs> Um, I think I, we can, um, I'd really like to thank you both. Um, it's been absolutely fantastic and encourage everyone to donate <laughs> their treasures to the Frick, but also definitely to visit um, Frick Madison 
when you can. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm hoping to see you all in New York soon. Thank you. Thank you so much.